tutorial today. First of all, I have an announcement for you. We have on this uh, Wednesday a company presentation from Deutsche Bank. And Deutsche Bank will give this presentation from 7 o'clock to 10 in the lecture room here at 3. This is a monthly presentation with lecture and with networking. And we have the chance to meet HR people, to meet top executives from Deutsche Bank. And they have a lot of job offers, a lot. Graduate programs, internships, they have really worldwide all opportunities. So I will give you this invitation for Wednesday this week and please let it circle so that everybody will have an invitation. So Today we want to speak about a new dimension in leadership, a new dimension about leadership in different situations. The question is in this approach, in which situation fits which leadership style best? And there was an, a model from Hersey and Blanchard. Hersey and Blanchard. And they call it the S2 model from the situated leadership. So, what is the, the idea, the idea of this model? The researchers found out four different leadership styles and the researchers combined these leadership styles with the development of the followers. The development in this case is the development in the competency, in education and the development in their motivational structure and in their personality. And the researchers combined these development levels of the followers and they found out four Phases or steps of the development level of the followers, and the researchers brought it in a chart. In a chart with several axes. And the model has two directions. On one hand, we have the supportive behavior styles, the supportive leadership behaviors, and on the other hand, they have a directive leadership behavior. The directive leadership behavior. So, then we have in the supportive and in the directive leadership behavior, we have a low situation and a high situation and also here a high. And here, this is the X for the development level of the followers. And there we have the situation that the follower is developing, he or she is in a developing situation and on the end of this scale, some step in the time, at the end we can say or we can see that the follower is in a developed situation. 
from the developing to the developed situation. That means that the follower has a lot of competence, a lot of motivation. I will tell you some facts to this, to this model and um, we have in this case and this X is very important for understanding and for organizing and training the situation. This X is very important, the development level. This is the development level of the followers. So, we want to start with the first development level. What could be the first development level of your followers? You are leader. Give an example. What could be the first development level? If you are a, you, if you are a leader, you hire a new person, then you make an evaluation. What is the development level? What is, could be the first development level? The of the world. Yeah. What in which qualification or in which quality can be evaluated? Experience and knowledge. In, and in which rank if you make rankings? Uh, what could be? What what could it be? It could be you have an idea? Okay. You have an idea? Yeah, if you have very low level and then you have Okay, if you if you can explain it in an example. Give us, give us an example. Like for example, if I'm an intern and I'm doing my first internship. Okay. And I don't have any experience and I think that I have any skills. Okay. So I have the you know But you have a low competence. But what else? Ah, yeah, okay. What, what else? What else? Not, not bad. Okay, what else? You have high commitment. Yes, high commitment. You have, on one hand, low competence. Okay, of course. New job, and you have learned a lot, but the new job has own criteria. So, you have a low competence, and you have a high commitment. You want to learn. You want to develop yourself. <coughs> Low competence, I write a C, and high commitment, also a C. And that is the first, the first phase of the development level. That means the person is new to the task, but the person is very interested, very committed. We go together with you in the goal, reach, and reaching, and so high commitment. And that is a low developing situation. Then we have the next one. We have the next step in the development. What could be the next step? And what is an example? What is the next step? What could be the next step? You Yes. We have more skills, but still you are committed, but not that much committed. Um, like him, you're more likely like a trainee or something. Like a trainee. Okay, like a trainee. Other ideas. What could be? Can you explain other? Do you have now another idea? You? No, no. Idea? Or your neighbor? What could be there? Think practical as an executive. You hire a person as a graduate for a trainee program. What could be the development level? Maybe not low. In the next step, it is what? What do you think? The next moderate. step. Can you bring in plan? Moderate. Moderate. Some competence, not that much. You have a moderate situation in the development level. But you have two, two aspects. In the, in the moderate level of the development, you have, in this case, as you said, some competence and you have a low commitment. That means the person has started to learn, and he, but 
maybe he have lost some first motivation. Maybe the person sees, oh, there is a lot to learn, it is too much for me, maybe, in this phase. Therefore, we have a next phase. We have a next phase, and you call this phase the moderate phase, moderate development level. And you have two, two points in this phase. The first point he mentioned, it is some competence and low commitment. But what could, what could be the next step in the development level of the followers in the moderate situation? What do you think? Think practical. What is the next step? We will hear later in our guest lecture maybe some ideas to promote these development levels. What is the next step? The next step is a moderate high competence. So it is more than some competencies, it's a moderate high competence and also a low commitment. But why a low commitment in this phase? In this phase? High, moderate high competence and low commitment. What could be the reason? If you are thinking on a new person in a new job. What could be the reason? What do you think? Think practically. What could be the think on yourself? What could be the reason? Moderate high competence, you call it a D3. This is a D3, D1, D2. What could be the reason in D3 development level 3, moderate high competence, low commitment? Yes, yes, very good. You are unsecure. Maybe you have not so the confidence as you not the trust in your ability, so you have to prove it. You have to prove it, to train it, you have to be challenged. And all these we will hear if we are completing the model, but first we will hear a lot from our guest lecture. But what could be the next, the last part in the development level? We have a D4, development level step 4. What could be the step four? So high competences and high commitment. High competence and high commitment. How can you explain it a little bit more? Bring an example from your experience. Like for example, a boss manager which is doing a job in which he is really motivated and is uh, really keen on uh, accomplishing uh, his uh, goals and uh, he is really convinced that he can uh, accomplish his goals. Mm -hmm. That means skill and motivation for the job are really high. And what could this mean? What could this mean in your leadership situation? You have an employee, he is high commit high competencies, high commitment. What could it mean for your leadership situation in this case? I could use uh, the negative style to, the, to my employee giving him uh, free to do his uh, tasks in the way he wants uh, and, uh, taking, and uh, letting him take the responsibility for what he does. A delegation situation. But, as I mentioned, maybe I think one, one class or two classes before, delegation is an art. And we want to hear more about the art also of delegation because it's a balance and it's a risk balance. And so we will switch over to our guest lecturer today. A very warm welcome to Götz Posner, our guest lecturer from today. And I will give some uh, ideas for the short biography of Götz Posner. Götz Posner, born 1980 in Mainz, has managed the European brokerage house XTB in Germany for over four years now. 
Nationally and internationally, we developed and managed brands and customer networks successfully on a sustainable level. During his studies at the Cologne Business School, the brand expert laid the foundation for his career with various guest semesters abroad, among others at the University of California, Los Angeles. I also have been there in a really great school. His strong dedication was honored with the CBS Excellent Social Commitment Award. During his studies, he gained practical experience at well-known addresses such as the publishing house Axel Springer in Hamburg or the European Parliament in Brussels and Strasbourg. In the following times, Posner proved his leadership talent and expertise in various roles by showing the companies he worked for how they are able to implement and realize their strategies and performance targets for capability. He helped the brokerage house Alfari to sustainable growth in Germany and the rest of Central Europe and reinvented the brand XTB to become one of the top players within the European financial markets. After great successes in the areas of corporate strategy, marketing and public relations, Götz Posner is an inventor and inventor in the development and implementation of new and pioneering ideas. As a result, he continued his successful career in the financial sector. With his financial expertise and his passion for the financial world, Mr. Posner uses the daily challenges of the German market for its long-term success, in which he lets his customers and partners gladly anticipate. He regularly shares his findings with the public and is a frequent speaker at many prestigious and high-profile financial events and media channels in Germany and across Europe. A really great and a warm welcome to our guest lecturer and please come to us and then we want to switch in your presentation.
Quite surprisingly, a very, very good lecture. Um, not a, not a very dry lecture, let's say. Uh, so we decided to um, also have Professor Trummer as a little workshop uh, within XTB with uh, certain employees to show them what leadership styles um, are about today or nowadays. Because um, there are so many changes going on, and you hear leadership all the time. Being a leader, being a boss, leadership styles here, there, what is good leadership, how to become a successful leader. And that workshop proved um, that we made the right decision because we had a very good discussion. And I want to keep it as well today, a bit more um, interaction. Um, so I'm not going to go through a presentation with 200 slides telling you what I know and what I don't know, but more having an interactive discussion um, to show you a bit um, insights of the practical view within a, a small company and how we work there, uh, what kind of obstacles we have to uh, fight against, and um, fight is the right word because uh, boxing, he invited me to boxing uh, lessons as well. The last time I was sick but uh, my head sales was already there and uh, I saw some pictures so next time I'm definitely going. Because sports is also, um, you can use sports for, lead for your own leadership sk uh, skills as well. Uh, by growing yourself into um, certain targets you want to achieve. You want to maybe run a marathon or maybe you just want to start, I don't know, running or boxing or anything like that. And there are certain similarities which you can definitely bang through. So today I'm going to speak a bit um, about successful leadership, um, what, what we've been through within XTB. Um, XTB is a brokerage house, uh, we deliver financial services. And uh, in Germany, we're a pretty small team. I'm going to go to that later on um, and tell you a little bit more in detail what our core values were, what we had to fight with, what our goals were, and how we tried to reach those goals. Um, the tar Okay, it's plug and play, unfortunately not. Okay, it doesn't. Maybe. Okay, here it goes. Oh, Okay, this is um, sounds very impressive, huh? Successful leadership in global high performance teams. What does it mean? Um, I try to differentiate a little bit between leaders or being a leader and being a boss. <coughs> what would you say is the main difference between a leader and a boss? Does anybody know? One sentence, one word. Okay. So what would you think would be this? Leading like a boss. You write your boss like a WhatsApp or an SMS mm -hmm. saying, hi boss, I'll be unable to come to work tomorrow due to heavy rain, I don't know that now. And you know, good manager, good boss, good insider. In your job application, you mentioned swimming as your hobby, so see you at work at 7 a.m. Hmm, all right. He tried to have maybe a day off or something, um, or just to explain the situation. But um, he immediately <coughs> delivered the solution. So um, that's a matter of, or it's a question of uh, how to deal with problems. Is it the right way? Is it the wrong way? I mean, the employee showed him a problem and he delivered the solution. Pretty bossy, okay, but that's like leading like a boss, I would say. So. How do you perceive leadership skills at first sight? For example, you join a company, 
you maybe visit the Deutsche Bank uh, appointment tomorrow or on Wednesday, you get an internship or you get a traineeship, you start your first day at work, you get to know the people, your employees, your co-workers, and there's your new boss. <coughs> He's not going to be presented as the leader, that's your boss. So, um, but you will pretty soon probably find out you're all academics. Um, is he a good leader or is he a bad leader? At first sight, you won't probably know because there's no difference. You see those guys or girls or ladies or gents and that's a good leader and that's a bad leader. How do you differentiate it? You can't differentiate it at first sight because they're all pretty clear, pretty grass, they're like two glasses of water. There's no differentiation. After a certain amount of time, you might be able to differentiate who's a good leader and who's a bad leader. And there are no known core values which are like ingredients where you can say, okay, this is good, this is bad, because this differs from person to person. But in the end, you will pretty soon find out which is a good leader and who's a bad leader. Because the bad leader turns, he's not as transparent anymore. He's turning muddy, he's turning dusty. You're like, you don't have the feeling that he's leading the company or yourself or your business unit in the right direction. But, as I said, you see that after a certain amount of time, usually. I mean, there are certain aspects or certain situations where you know right away that this guy or this woman is not a, is not a good leader. So, what does it take to be a successful leader? I'm going to dive um, into um, my former um, company now, just to, to explain you the situations that we had to, to yeah, find solutions for. Um, the best practice case is, is, is to be online trading, a uh, leading provider of financial and online trading services, so to say brokerage house. Um, we in Germany, we were always around 15 employees, globally we were around 500 employees. Um, since April, we, are, uh, we have an IPO, we are a publicly traded company. Um, we have very, very flat hierarchy levels and um, communication words are very short. So if you, for example, are sitting in a group trying to decide anything, next promotion, next marketing, sales strategy, after the meeting it goes right off. There's no levels of um, approving um, from headquarters or anything like that. We're, we're acting more or less independently. We were under the umbrella of the global brand, but still as a um, as an independent entity, we, we could act the way we want. We had the, the good thing that we combined the best of both worlds. We're a structured enterprise with the startup mentality. Structured enterprise, you know, let's say Deutsche Bank, Continental, Lufthansa, they're, they're all very structured. You have um, certain rules and regulations, how to work there, what to do, what not to do. There are certain guys that can't take decisions very quickly, but usually it's very structured. Sort of mentality, everybody's running around, everybody's doing everything, and um, they're ordering pizza and fast food every day, and they're just trying to get the job done. So we had both. Every time we were employing new people, um, I asked this question. Would you rather work in a structured company or in a company with a startup mentality? Who would like to work in a company with very clear structures? Raise your hand. And who would prefer the startup mentality? Okay. That was one of the questions because I wanted to find out like how is the, the person thinking, like what do they what, what do they expect from working also with XTB, from the working atmosphere and all that kind of stuff. Um, we were highly dynamic. I mean, you read this in a lot from every job effort. We're highly dynamic, we're innovative, we have very good quality, and we're the best service uh, provider ever. But we were very highly dynamic, uh, very effective, um, because we had very short communication and also very short decision ways. Uh, the decisions were ROI based, always. It was always coming down to return on investment. What do you spend and what do you get for it? Why do you spend it if you don't get anything for it? Just for marketing purposes, basically, because that's where you spend the most money besides the HR costs and office and everything. But why do you run marketing um, 
if it doesn't bring leads, if it doesn't bring customers, if it doesn't generate return on investment. And we had the gut feeling of a founder and owner because it was still owner-based. Um, and he had the majority of the shares, so he's a major stakeholder. And of course, sometimes the moodiness of the headquarter, because um, one, the major headquarter was based in Poland, in Warsaw, and the other headquarter was, both, uh, was based in uh, London, UK. And in the financial area, um, and I'm speaking of banks, I'm speaking of direct banks, insurances, brokers, um, anything that is more or less related with financial products or services, the world is ticking ultra fast. And um, you sometimes feel like 24 hours is just not enough. And you might hear that in various other business areas as well, but especially in finance. Once you brought a product on the street, once you launch a promotion, you need to have the next one in line already. You need to be focused on what's going on, what's happening, what are the competitors doing, uh, are we right on track, are we doing the same thing. So the monitoring and analyzing processes are very, very, um, yeah, very, very um, important and they take up very much time. So here was the point um, where we sometimes had to really um, work or explain our, our shareholders or our mother in, in headquarters why we are doing that. Because especially in the German-speaking regions, financial services were different than in other countries. UK is a very saturated, very mature market when it comes to financial services and products. Germany, you need to build up a lot of credibility, a lot of trustworthiness. This takes time. And sometimes the headquarter doesn't have that time. They don't want to see that. So you need to act very quickly, explain and negotiate why you're doing this because you don't see the ROI the next day. But this is something um, what we tried, what we had to live with. This was some, some insights about the company. And uh, just to my person, very quickly, I started in the consultancy right after uh, graduating from university and had the, um, the opportunity to look in various companies. From, from very different um, uh, areas. Um, there were enterprises like BASF, um, Adidas, Credit Suisse, um, tourism companies um, all over. And the funny thing is um, that in terms of image, when you have the feeling that, because at some point you all will have or will take a decision, what company do I want to start working for? On what kind of points do you base this decision? And you can accept it or you can't, but most of the time, the first thing that comes into your mind is image. How do you perceive this brand, this company? Everybody would first maybe say Nike or Adidas, wow, that's cool. Work in the sports industry, you know, design some sneakers, everybody's cool, go to parties, Christmas parties, that's cool. And sometimes you hear names of companies you've never heard before. You look at the internet uh, web page and you see, oh my god, I would never ever work there. I had to work for all of those kind of things. And I had the same, the same problem. The first brands I saw and I had to work with them, like, oh my god, this is so cool. I'm working for, for Adidas now, I'm working for Credit Suisse, and this is going to be really, really cool. Um, once you dive into there, um, get to know the employees, get to know the structures, because after two or three months, you know more about the company than most of the employees that worked there for years, because you don't do anything else than just dive into digging out information and everything. And after a certain amount of time, there was a point where I said, I would never ever work here, because the working climate was disastrous. Um, the, the employees were not friends at all. And there were some companies, they were small, they were sometimes family owned, nobody really knew about them, they were big players in terms of turnover. You dove into there, they were having lunch with the family. And they were talking to each other, they were finding solutions together. Um, they had employee benefits, crazy, the, the, the Christmas party was crazy. And then it was like, um, okay, I would, I would really think about working here, starting to work here. So this is just a personal um, hint when you choose a company, of course, for your CV, it's always important name dropping because once you change, everybody knows Golden Sacred, Bank, all these kind of things. But if at a certain period of time or a certain point of uh, time in your life, you will realize that names is not everything. 
and sometimes when you start having a family or anything else, um, the, the term life-work balance, I call it life-work balance, most of them call it work-life balance, um, is getting more and more important. So you start looking for companies that match your values more than just a big name which everybody says, wow, you work for that company, really? Yeah, but it's 80 uh, hours a week and um, actually I'm not really quite satisfied. So that's the point. And, um, I went over to the financial industry, um, started at Alpari, brought up Alpari. Um, they were not on the German market and um, our mission was to build up the teams. How do you do that? We started in the Messe Tower, we had a nice building, we had no one around, nobody knew that brand. So what do you do? You advertise positions that are open, okay? Um, and then we had the same problem. There were people with high knowledge, no involvement. They knew everything. So are we going to hire those guys that know the products, know how it's done, and know how everything works, but they don't really care? Or do we do the other way around and uh, hire maybe juniors, which are hungry, which do not have maybe the business sense or the product knowledge, but they're willing to learn it and are even more loyal. So we started doing that, building up the brand, building up the marketing, uh, which went really quite well. And after um, a couple of years, I um, got contacted by Headhunter, which offered me the position of marketing director at XTB. I actually talked to my former boss then and told him that. <coughs> said, you know, um, I have the possibility to build up a brand which is a competitive for myself. What do you think? <laughs> so he said, yeah, you know, what, what do I think? I mean, I would be losing a good marketing guy, um, going to the comp a competitor and, you know, building up that thing. Um, we were competitors in a certain way, but we still have various business skills. And from my consultancy point of view, as a brand strategy consultant, um, he learned that it was very important for me to do that, to um, build up a brand which had a lot of potential, but which was um, led in a very, very bad way. So I went over to XTB um, as a marketing director, did this for one and a half years and got promoted to managing director. And what I was doing the last five years is not focusing on products, not focusing on training platforms, not focusing on on anything product related, let's say. I focus on the human factor and I question myself, okay, what can we do to make to give this to give this company a face, to make it more credible? And what we didn't do is we didn't hire any specialists out of these uh, out of the business sector from finance. We hired guys from tourism, we hired cooks we hired salespeople from automotive. Because the thing was, I talked to my head of sales back then and said, what can we do? We can train those guys within four to six weeks in products, CFDs, derivatives, contracts, anything, no problem. But what we cannot do is teach a sales hard or teach really the motivational skills. That's, that's something we cannot really teach. You can enable it, but over a really long certain amount of time. So we hired those guys. They were very, very happy. They were even really almost overreacting because they said nobody would ever come to that idea hiring us in the financial area because we didn't have any expertise. Like it's not about the expertise. It's about the commitment. And the commitment is something which you see in your first rehearsal. When you have your first job interview and you go over there you know, I only have A's, I have um, the best NASA pieces, blah, 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 I have MBA, I, should, I know everything, theoretically probably, uh, so um, where can I start? Or you deliver them something which they want to have, because that's what most companies are looking for, intrinsic motivation. Why should the company hire you? Just because you're, you know the products? You, you probably won't know the products better than anybody else working there already. But if you are highly motivated and you are very loyal and you give them the feeling that you add a certain value to this company by hiring you as a person and not as an encyclopedic book which knows everything, then you have a USP. But this is something which you cannot play. I mean, you can play it, maybe they don't see it, but after a certain amount of time, you, you won't be happy in this company because 
Remember, not only your values have to match for the company, the values of the company also have to match you. Because then, you will be fine. But if you, if, the, if this doesn't match, after a certain amount of time, you won't be happy in this company. Because the company goes in, the, in, the, in another direction than you are moving. So, back to this, we had to really work on the people and what we've done is the good old leader recipe, like how you were supposed to, to define a leader. You know, it's high educational background, many years of business experience, perfect social skills, you have very good soft skills, has the ability to make tough decisions, fire people, you know, demonstrates authority, highly productive and very demanding. That was like the, the good old leader recipe, right? That's a leader. If you go, like, for example, to a political discussion that we'll face tomorrow, that's like the Donald Trump, right? You know? That's the guy. That's the leader. He has everything. Yeah. Okay. But we're in fast-moving times, guys. So the question is, is this recipe still working? What do you think? What do you think really makes a good leader, a successful good leader? What are two or three bullet points? There's no right or wrong. Anybody? What would you say makes a good leader? Intelligence? Cleverness? Motivation? Motivation. Charisma. Charisma? Why do you say uh, charisma? It's something you can't learn really. It's um, the one ability that leads others to work more to get this um, high commitment. Very good. Listening and taking care of all the employees. Honesty. Honesty. This is exactly what I was looking for. Because times have changed. There is no old leader recipe where you see you just demonstrate it through authority. I mean even in the in the army where, where everybody is looking or really have to, to work by commands, times have changed. But if you see this one, one year ago before I was born, there's like 250 megabytes. I like that's like 30 songs of your playlist or something. Um, went on a hard drive which weighed 250 kilograms and cost around 25,000 euros. That's like 37 years ago. Today, we have a thousand times of the storage on a flash card, which is, you know, you know how big it is. It's like that. Right? It's five grams and it costs less than 100 bucks. This is just showing you how fast times are changing. And not only, this is just from a storage point of view, like just storage of information. But also, times have changed in leadership styles. I'm sure you've done some internships or some, some trainees or heard of some people, maybe in the investment banking or M&A um, uh, boutiques, uh, where you see that. There's a boss, here's the business, basically, that needs to get developed, or gets, uh, needs to get uh, from. So here are the employees, and there's the boss, telling them, all right, go, move, move, move. We need to get the business done. Plus, they're carrying him as well. And the leader, he's not sitting here telling them do anything, or, or push me, or pull out the business, or do whatever. He's up front. He's giving up the direction, but he's showing them by example. He's leading by example. The employees. So he's confident. What you were mentioning. He's honest because he's also pulling the thing. And people are believing him because they're following him because they said, okay, if he's telling us, maybe he doesn't even know how it's done. Why should I do it? He's got, he's up there. He's in the mud, let's say, with the team. So he's on the same level. And on hierarchy levels, you always hear that. Why are the people above? They don't know what we're doing down here. You hear that a lot of times in business. If they would come down to us and we would have the ability to talk to them, we could explain them what kind of problems we have and why the business is not developing. Because up there, they're just drinking coffee bottle. 
That's the old uh, the, uh, discussion we are always facing. So what are the differences? I'm sorry, but this is only the PDF because usually it's animated. And, but this is the, the boss we're talking about. So he drives the employees. No, do that. Come on. He depends on authority. He needs. He doesn't want to be questioned because what he says is the truth. He cares for productivity. Show me what you've done. It doesn't matter if it's really for the business development. But if you've done something, and I'm sure <coughs> you've had it, uh, in your own career or a student life as well, then sometimes writing an essay or sometimes delivering something, for God's sake, because it doesn't help anybody, but you just have to do it. He says I, because I is very important, me, myself, and I. That's the boss. He's fear-driven. You're not going to talk to him. You're not going to say no. Because fear is a very powerful tool of that guy. He generates demoralization. He doesn't want it. He takes credit. So if the team has done it for him, and he's talking to his boss, that yeah, it was all my decision, and they've just done what I told them to do. That's because I need a promotion. Says go. Does his face, really. And he gives orders. It's this is the typical bossy behavior. And of course, back to the slide before, he knows how it's done. And don't question him because he knows better. And most of the time he doesn't really give feedback. And at some point you don't actually really care about this feedback anymore because you don't receive it. And that's when the loyalty also is sinking. The leader instead, he inspires employees. He depends on respect and he cares for well-being. Those are all the, the points that you mentioned before. He says, we, we are in the same boat. We are driving this, the, we need to drive the business uh, development. Uh, his inspiration driven generates enthusiasm, um, gives credit. This is very, very important because if you don't give credit and also take, always take credit, people will stop working for you or will stop doing the best they can because why should they do it? says, let's go, and this is very important, says, go, or let us go, go together, we. He asks, he asks also for well-being, or for a kind of feeling. What we've done, um, when we generated the teams, the restructured the teams, we created a monthly brainstorming, um, which was once a month, where the whole team went into the conference room, and I gave them around two to three hours away from their daily duties, and I just wanted to hear ideas from them. Anything. There, was no, there were no borders. I had to pick them up at some point when they had crazy marketing ideas. But um, what I wanted to have, there was the, the office management, there was compliance, HR, marketing, sales, uh, customer support. Uh, we had video conferences. Um, I wanted to generate out of this pool as much as possible from the knowledge from different points of use. Because sometimes, when you're into marketing, you know everything. You know, you know everything. But sometimes it's really the way man sieht den Wald voller Bäume. And the thing is, sometimes we had really, really good ideas that came from the office management in terms of marketing or sales structure. And we were actually that's quite a good idea. Why didn't we come up with that? Ask the sales team or ask the marketing team. And so that's what I'm just trying to tell you is sometimes the guy, the specialist need also a view from the outside to enhance them to, to think about other stuff or other ideas. So this is definitely something what we try to, to do or what I try to, to live by, um, to have an open door policy that, that people and employees will always be able to come to you, ask you, okay, what's the problem? Um, give feedback. We had 360 degrees feedback where they were also able to, to rate the, the management levels. So you know how you are perceived. Because maybe you have the feeling of the best manager in the world, and in the survey you find out, no, it's not. You communicate maybe differently. So what are useful ingredients for successful leadership? <coughs> we, have, we heard already some. Uh, but here are just some that I uh, summarized once again. You need to understand and evaluate the current state you are in. So if you are, for example, um, working on a complex process, or you need to, maybe you need to release people, you need to fire people, or you need to find new people. You need to find out what kind of stage am I in, and how do others perceive that. 
So if you just say, okay, um, fine, you're just fired, I don't need you anymore, maybe not the best decision, think about it. And it's, it's, it's also about self-reflection. Um, establish clear goals and targets where you want to go. Very important. This is something which most of the people say, yeah, 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 let's clear, let's clear. No, it's not. If you, for example, find out the next time you have a task or a, a group essay or anything like that, and you start working, and after a certain amount of time you will ask the people, do you exactly know what your task is or what you have to do? I don't know, maybe most of the people will say yes, 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 because they want to avoid the discussion. Um, but if you hear or listen to yourself, you sometimes feel that these are points which are really important, that you exactly know what to do and what you are working for or told us to. Listen to your employees and question them. Listen. Very, very important. Most of the managers or most of the directors I've been working with, um, they don't, they try to listen, but um, when employees are really talking to you and they're opening themselves, which is quite hard for them to talk honestly, you need to have um, a good sparring partner and you need to have a feeling, you need to know that this guy that you're talking to is honest. Because otherwise you say, no, no, everything's fine. Everything's cool, everything's fine. And two hours later you will submit your CVs to different recruiting agencies. That's not what it's all about. Challenge your own skills and motivation. Don't only challenge others, challenge yourself. If you, don't, if you stop challenging yourself, you will stay not only where you are, you will take a step back because others will surprise you faster than you think. So if you sometimes say, um, you know, marketing, online marketing, SEO, SEM, I'm God. Okay, so how do you do? Do you do any do more training? So no, no, I know everything. I read some newspapers and do, do my daily job. You will soon find out that even you guys, uh, then younger brothers, younger sisters, 10 years old, have the iPads, um, starting coding. I mean, my, my nephew, he's 14. He um, coded uh, an iPad app, a game app. He's 14. And I was like, I saw the game and I could play the game. I had no idea what he was doing and how, he done, how he's done it. He said through YouTube tutorials. He was just into it and learning. So I'm just saying, never say that you are the master because you, you will always you can always go further gather feedback and reflect your own decisions gather feedback from your colleagues from your family from your maybe employees co-workers whatever if you do, uh, if you sometimes um, think about applying for a new job what do you do first you screen maybe the internet web page of that company ask some people who may work there go to sing on linkedin Go to Glassdoor and Kulu to check out what are the salaries. And also you could you could challenge yourself by having the first interview. Make an interview with your maybe not mom or dad or with your best friends or somebody maybe closely related to that area. <coughs> and try to really perform an interview. Not on a funny basis. I mean it can have funny moments, but try to do that. Try to learn. Try to practice it, because then you are maybe prepared for some events or some situations that might be able or might be responsible for the decision if they hire you or not. You can train it. Be open-minded and enable your colleagues. This is also something. If you sometimes have the feeling, ah, oh, okay, I helped that my co-worker the 20th time. I'm not going to help the 21st time. Okay, different story, because especially if that guy is taking the credit for you. But if somebody's struggling and needs some support or some help, help them. Why not? Be human. Give feedback and break down motivational barriers. That's something what we've learned within our teams so much. Um, there were sales guys with 30 years um, having, having around yeah, 10 to 12 years of experience really in sales techniques and everything. We had girls out of the tourism business who made them really stunned. They were on the phone, they were talking to clients, and those guys were, were hanging at the phones, looking at the girls, saying, how long has she been doing that? Uh, now, four days. But she was before in tourism, service clerks, having to do with people, smiling, 
you can hear a smile through a telephone, I tell you. If you're on the phone and you're just doing sales because you need to do it, you need to make that phone call or you need to do it, then better don't do it. Be committed. If you're committed, it works. And if you're working for a promotion or hoping for a promotion, because everybody else gets promoted, but you're not. Why? Because the world is so unfair? Most likely not. <coughs> Listen, learn, improve, and repeat. And this is something what I learned as well. Because I worked in that company for five years. I'm not working with XTB anymore. I um, signed a mutual agreement together with the head of sales because, as I said, in April we had uh, an IPO. Uh, we had the emission price and the price went up, went up, went up. And then in July it started to fall. So what happened? It is an owner-based or an owner or founder-based um, company still. They started to fire people first, my boss, then my deputy, then in the headquarter, really, really good people um, were picked or were released, let's say, um, and in other branches as well. Uh, and at one point, um, the CEO came to our um, uh, office in Frankfurt and had a talk with us, an open talk, and uh, told us as well, guys, you know, um, I'm always happy with uh, loyal um, and motivational people, but unfortunately not everybody sees that in this company. So it was a, back to the gut feeling of the owner, it was a gut feeling of the owner to save, I don't know, maybe money um, to, to break it down in each, uh, in each of the branches um, to stabilize business. Unfortunately, it showed that the decision so far has not been so good, um, but um, they tried to change the, ter the strategy, especially for the German market. And um, I explained them that the strategy, especially for the German-speaking regions, is really simple. It just takes time, because you need to build up trustworthiness, you need to build up credibility, and this cannot be done from today to tomorrow. So the strategies let's say, this match. And um, I was fine with that because um, I wouldn't want to change my personal attitude or my strategy for the time being just to play by someone's gut feeling in that case. But that's everyone's own decision. Would I still do take this job five years ago and do the same thing again? Absolutely. Because I had a tremendous time. I learned a lot. I had really awesome colleagues, um, it was a fantastic trip, um, building up the teams, learning a lot, um, facing a lot of obstacles and challenges, um, and I am I'm the opinion that um, you can only truly learn or evolve yourself when you are in situations um, which are not easy. The best situations where you have the highest targets, we had, we had one year where we were doubling the targets, and everything was absolutely perfect. We had a huge Christmas party, very nice bonuses and all kinds of stuff. And um, until I make the budgets for next year and even increased it by 25%, the targets. And um, they were doubled just because it was possible to show. So always remember, um, sometimes you have good times, enjoy the good times, um, and always keep on working. But um, you learn more when you are struggling. This is when you really are able to learn and to improve yourself. And this is just something what you can keep in mind. It's not um, a scientifically proven model, <laughs> so to say. But um, it's, I call it be active, you know? Just be active. Um, and be approachable. So that people can really approach you. And maybe tell you about the problems, or ask you, or, or learn from you, or learn with you. So be proactive and listen sometimes. It's so easy, but it's, it's on the other hand so hard to sit there and listen. Communication, communicate. Express your expectations clearly. I've seen it so many times in agencies where the client communicates something what he wants to have, 
and the agency says, yes, we understood. Then they, <laughs> then they show the results and the client says, no, that's not what I wanted. So did you communicate wrongly or did we perceive it wrongly? Mm, I don't know. If in doubt, check twice. <laughs> T, transform. Learn from the challenge. You don't have to stay the way you are. You can transform. You can transform in a sportive style. I, for example, I tried 2009, I tried my first marathon with no training because I wanted to, to prove to my uh, wife back then um, that it's 90% head and 10% body. I did it, uh, but it was not very good for my body. But at least I um, showed her that it's possible. But the next one I trained for and now I'm, I'm into triathlon, which six, seven years ago, if somebody would have told me, uh, yeah, Gertz, you will run a, a triathlon, like, yeah, sure, maybe in my next life. So it's possible. Don't always say, no, nah, you know, it's a comfort zone. I want to stay here, it's all cool. And if it's good, it's fine. You don't have to change every day by saying, like, okay, I need to. But sometimes giving up old habits just because you did it, smoking, only, only eating meat or whatever, try, try something else, transform. It's fun. It's really fun. You can learn a lot. Interact. Lead by example. Show people what you learn and share the knowledge. Don't always keep it for yourself because you said, ah, if I'm sharing it, somebody will take it away and, ah, no. I mean, if you have the Coke recipe, maybe you keep it for yourself. But other than that, value, which is very important also for our employees back then. What we've done always was value, and not only incentivation on a monetary basis. Monetary incentivation is the shortest incentivation that there is. Believe it or not, I'm not sure if there's. I'm sure there is scientific reform data, but um, monetary incentivation or monetary or salaries is a must factor, and there needs to be progressive. We need to come along. We need, we need to move. There needs to be improvement. But if you give somebody a bonus, say, Yo, here's your bonus. Say, Yo, wait, I did it. Really, really cool. Last two days, three days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. If you tell somebody from time to time that they've done a really good job, and you tell them, maybe also in front of other people, you've done a great job. Thank you very much. Because of your commitment, because of you organizing this trade fair, because of you programming this talk. We, we are now here, we are now able to have these results. Thank you very much. Give them a weekend trip to Barcelona, to Vienna. It's, it's also monetary based, but it's a different valuation. If you tell the people and you value them, and you incentivize them on this basis, they are totally differently connected than just giving you a paycheck. The loyalty increases, and you can learn from that by really having loyal uh, employees in your, um, in your company. And, of course, establish. If you found some routines or standards which work, establish them. Question them once in a while. If they still work, and if they are still the right ones. But, if you have effective life workflows, implement them. Why not? And, yes, this is just a little bit of insights um, from me, myself, and I, and nobody I work for. So I'm open for any discussions. The key learnings is just like just a little summary now. Um, you can go through. Um, but it was a pleasure for me. I hope it wasn't too boring for you guys. And um, if you have any questions or any discussion, um, I have a chance with you. Thank you very much. Personal, personal evaluations and you're you are also very very practical yeah. practical advice and recommendations and, and this really vital yeah. presentation <laughs> it was fantastic <laughs> so now we want to have some questions and answers please your questions take the chance the opportunity to hear interesting answers so Please, here, last row. Um, I work as a journalist at CNN. Uh, last three months ago, I went to Bangladesh 
to check uh, the chain for the clothing of H&M. Yeah. And uh, last month I went, uh, I met the CFO of uh, H&M, and uh, he explained to me as a CFO, of course, it's uh, always about um, ROI, always about um, growth, always about profit. But then uh, it's not always um, mirrored in their um, financial report. They they experience some slower growth uh, this year, even though a lot of people seem to still like it, still the products. Um, I, I saw the trend of this sustainability clothing and the green, eco-friendly clothing in, in, the, in the public. Uh, as a leader, how do you balance between what's happening in the public or what they want you know, as a, as a customer, I want to buy sustainable clothing. I don't want five-year-old children making my clothes, but I want a cheap clothing as well. I mean, affordable clothes. Exactly. But as a leader, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to see it. I want my company to grow because there is um, competitors, like maybe it's, Bangladesh is cheap and then Vietnam yeah, cheaper. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, how, it's how? a thin red line because on, on the one hand, I totally agree. You need to make profits. On the one hand, you need to shift the company or the strategy of the company to being ecologically correct or being sustainable. So there's this is something what, what the automotive uh, industry has to, to work with as well. They are fighting against Apple and Google now, trying to transform the digital area, but still, you know, processing normal uh, automotive parts to make money. So um, this is something which also takes time, and the CFO doesn't like time, you know. See if all likes numbers. And especially if they have to invest money for programs like sustainability, they need to take back the clothes. They need to have employees which uh, check the clothes. Um, in the end, when it starts working and the routine starts, people might come more to H&M because they say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm ecologically aware. I want to have this ability to not like Primark, for example, where, I don't know, kids for five cents are I don't know, suing my, my church, but it's not going to happen from today to tomorrow. So it's going to be a strategic decision. The CFO then will have to make a forecast, for example, saying we need to spend money uh, for this project within the long term because he's making a monthly and a yearly budget, probably also a five year budget. Plus, he will have an estimated ROI by those are like consumer studies then. How many more clients would come to H&M when launching this project? Because, of course, it's first it's good for the public because they can show we're green. This is not everything. Secondly, it needs to have a business note. We need to, why? We're not going to only do it for the environment because, okay, some companies will start it because they want to be the first mover. But secondly, we want to have a return on investment, which is improving. How? Because we're, doing, we're playing it in, in, in PR, articles, we have journalists talking about us, and then more people will be aware of it, and then changing maybe from Zara to H&M, or maybe from CLA to Hanover. So it's, it's always a thin red line, but the strategy, the strategy needs, to be, um, needs to be ROI based. It ha always has to have a certain note, which is breaking down the numbers in the end. More questions, please? Who has a question? Please. If you have a bad boss, who's a bad leader, how would you deal with that? Excuse me. Yeah. If you have a bad boss? Yeah, right. <coughs> how, would you, how, would you, how would you deal with it? How would you deal with it? Question yourself. If you have a bad boss and you're directly reporting him, what would you say is a bad boss? How is he bad? Uh, the guy doesn't, doesn't talk to you or doesn't Okay. First of all, I would use the the, um, the things we evaluated here more or less. If you if you are honest, if you are confident, and if you are trustworthy in that case, you would approach him, or I would approach him in that case, asking for a for an open feedback talk, maybe under four eyes, maybe whatever. And if he declines that, or if he says, yeah, we can have that, but I don't, I don't see any sense in that because you're, I don't know, I don't care about you. Um, it's a question of you um, saying, am I stuck at this position in that company? 
is it the position I want to keep if my boss, the which I'm directly reporting, is that way and he's not changing? Is there a possibility to talk to HR? Is there an HR partner? But not behind his back. I would first always have the open discussion. And in the end, if there's no possibility of development, you would have to question yourself if you want to live in that situation or if you need to change the, the companies in the end, which would be the last decision. More questions, please? I have a question. We have a mega trend <laughs> now and in the future it is a digital transformation. Some of your good friends we have to live with. The question is, what are from your point of view the most important questions we have to ask for leadership and we have to ask for establishing leadership? The question, uh, I think the most important question I believe is um, how are we using the personal approach? Because um, leadership skills, in my perspective, perception, is something which a person really, really yeah, shows or is perceived by people. And um, for example, the digital area, if you take for example Apple or Steve Jobs, he was leading that company which shocked us all in the digital area more or less, um, but was still also to his own employees, not only on the keynote speeches, um, very visionary. So he, he explained his visions. He, he was unmistakably, um, and he, he told the people what he wants to achieve and how he wants to achieve that. And in the digital area where everything is going through data lines and, and projects and processes and um, this gets lost sometimes, the interpersonal behavior or the interpersonal relationships. And I think um, what we've done as well is we established face-to-face -face meetings, uh, we established brainstormings, we established weekly meetings. When we really sat down and uh, there, was, um, there were no cell phones and laptops allowed, um, so we had notes, no, really notepads with a pen, so sometimes you need to tell people how to write again. Um, but every, uh, all the, um, the brainstorming or the ideas, I wanted them to write down, to draw, to, I don't know, draw circles or make mind maps or anything like that, which with a laptop or an iPad, I mean, you can do it, but I wanted that shifted away because we were living in the digital area day by day. I mean, online training, we, we only had to do with lead generation, bad placements, um, mass where you enter addresses, um, everything was digital. And this way, I had um, all the employees around me talking face to face and um, really living or taking the digital area on an analog, uh, in an analog way. Other question? Please. Uh, so I have a question. I really appreciated your differentiation between the boss and the leader, but I'm wondering if, it, if this differentiation on does also work outside of a hierarchical context. I mean, if we take like a group, which have to do well in our case, like uh, to write an essay, for example. So we have a group, so all our students at the, the same level. And then, well, there is a person which is more well, let's say it has a more commanding authority, so it's more like a boss. And then there is like other people which are more like gentle, more like listening to others. So according to the model, like perhaps more as leaders. But in this case, people, or at least from my personal experience or point of view, tend to follow the boss rather than the leader. So. With, uh, outside of a hierarchical context, does uh, leadership really work? Or Absolutely, it's a good question. Um, because the thing is, in this kind of groups, there is no level yet. Because the group is just shifted together. It's sometimes where you might have seen it in assessment centers or something, where you just get shifted with other people together, you, you don't know before, never seen before, and you just have to work with them. Who's going to take the lead? And what they've done is also the consultancies, they're not going to tell you you're going to be the leader or you're going to be the executive part or whatever. <coughs> they, want to, they want you to evolve. And they want you to find out who's leading, who's alpha, who's better. And I agree to a certain point. If somebody in a, in a certain project really says, 
you know, everybody's talking, um, this is blah, blah, bullshit, let's get it done, come on. You're going to do that, you're very good in research, you're going to do that, um, I'm going to take part of it and I'm going to present it because I'm the best. So what's going to happen, uh, people might question, like, um, well, have you seen it? Whoa, authority, whoa, okay, maybe he's the best person. They will start discussing, because he made it clear that it's going to happen his way or no way. A leader would maybe then say, if there is a sophisticated leader in there, say, like, maybe um, we should first analyze who, whose core competencies are. Maybe you're the best at presenting, um, but maybe I've seen Anna presenting, she's way better, or whatever. Um, so it would work in the, in the beginning if nobody complains. The thing is, if you get the best results, if, because if nobody complains, if the thing is, is, it, is the importance high enough on that project that somebody says, you know, mm, I, would, I would maybe use a different approach. So you're totally right. If, if the boss goes for this position and wants to have it, he probably, in this short-term period, project will keep it. I would say. More questions? Okay. So once again, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. We have a gift for our lecturer, and one, one information for you, our lecture goes on. We have a day tutorial. <laughs> I try to be brief, yes. <laughs> okay, you may follow here. Here is this view, and this is from Russia. <laughs> <laughs>